Hey biologist, Mr. Font here. For today's lecture that we're going to be covering is the properties of water from chapter three. First up, we're going to talk about the must knows. Here's a few things that we will be going over in this mini lecture. The importance of hydrogen bonding as it relates to the properties of water. And then of course, talk about the properties of water themselves and then touching base a little bit on how they contribute to life on earth. So first up, before we go on to anything else, I want to talk about polarity. So if you think of like poles, like we have a North Pole, South Pole, that's like a great line of thinking as you're thinking and relating this to our water molecules. So observe the image that's down below of our water molecules. There's five of them down there, and there's a couple extra symbols that you may notice. Now there's kind of like a squiggle with a circle on it. Uh, that's actually a Greek symbol delta. It's the equivalent of our letter D in our alphabet, if you will. Uh, so that, that little delta symbol actually represents or means like a little bit. So not a full charge as it's indicating the positives and the negatives. It's a little charge or like a partial charge. Sometimes it's referred to as. So when we have or take a look at our water molecules, we can see that they have a partial charge. This is referring to the polarity. Water molecules do behave very similar to things like magnets if you've ever played with them. They have a slightly positive side and a slightly negative side. If you try to put two positives next to each other, they will repel. You take a positive and a negative and they will be attracted to one another. So our water molecules, if we observe closely, we can see that the oxygens have a slight negative charge, the delta negative, and the hydrogens have a slight positive charge, the delta positive. So this is in reference to the polarity of what is going on within our water molecules. Specifically, the hydrogen bonding is represented by the dashed lines. Notice how it's not a solid line. A solid line represents a covalent bond. In this case, we're not talking about covalent bonds. This is a hydrogen bond. We'll get more into hydrogen bonding as we see further examples. Next up, we're going to talk about a property of water, specifically cohesion. So if we break apart this word into prefix and suffix, that prefix co represents like together, like co-workers, you're working together, or like um, similar is really what it really refers to. So when we're talking about cohesion, hesion referring to like sticking, um, in this case, we're talking about things sticking to or being attracted to like molecules or they're working together. So they're going to be very similar. So this would be water basically wanting to stick to itself or stick to other water molecules. This creates a special property called surface tension. So this is best represented by water striders or water bugs as sometimes they're called. And you can see that it kind of looks like they're walking on water, but they're not really, they're just bending water. So the surface tension would be like a piece of paper where you set something on it, it might create a little divot, so it's gonna bend, but it won't break. And this is referred to as surface tension, but it's specifically because of the cohesion. Those water molecules want to pull against each other, stick to each other, uh, and they're going to create a bending motion within our water, the surface. Next would be the opposite, would be adhesion. So adhesion, again, sticking to. That prefix ad means other or unlike molecules in this case. So this is water, water molecules that are sticking to other substances. So the example that we see here is water sticking to a blade of grass. You might be represented of this of like in mornings and things you might see the morning do. Or if you take water, put it on your hand, you notice it kind of wants to drip or stick to your hands. Uh, so it's another good example. So adhesion sticking to other things, and it can counteract things like the pull of gravity, as is mentioned in our notes here. Another special property is transpiration. So what we see here on the right is a cross section of a tree. Uh, so inside there, much like us, we have veins and arteries. They have their own system of veins and arteries referred to as xylem and phloem. So that's all the open spaces that you see in kind of that purplish color over there. That's a cross section of a tree, all of the quote unquote veins and arteries. So the water is able to move as a combination between cohesion and adhesion. It'll stick to the walls of their xylems and then pull themselves up through cohesion. So they'll stick to the walls, adhesion, stick to each other, cohesion, and they can pull themselves up and move through plants, which is a pretty interesting thing. Next up, we're going to talk about temperature and how water can play into temperature uh, and heat amount of different bodies of water. So first up, let's define some terms. Heat refers to the total amount of kinetic energy that's in a system. 
temperature is the measurement of the intensity or the average kinetic energy of molecules. So you and I, when we say, oh, it's you know, 75 degrees outside, that's a temperature that you and I have a correlation to. But really what that's meaning is the average amount of motion that these molecules are in there. So let's look at some examples of how water can play a factor into temperatures. So this is one of our last properties we'll talk about for water is what's called high specific heat. Basically to sum it up, it means that water is able to hold on to energy. So it can absorb a lot of energy. So if something is trying to resist the heat or temperature change, then water is a great source to do that. So water will cool things down very quickly because it will absorb that water or the heat energy. So here's an example over at the coast of California that we can see. Uh, and there are a list of different cities as well as their temperatures on average. So we can see the closer you are to the water, you're going to have the cooler temperatures. As you move away from the water, you start to have higher temperatures. Again, referring to the average kinetic energy, the motion of those particles. In part, this is caused because of the amount of water that's next to it absorbing all that heat energy. So it can't uh, make its way into the coastal regions, all that heat because of all the water that's trapping the heat energy. But as you get away from the coast, now that water's not there to trap that heat energy, and so the temperature is allowed to rise. We use this in our bodies to help us with the cooling process. So for instance, if you happen to be exerting a lot of energy, so like you're running around, this man's playing tennis, or whatever sorts of physical activity, you may uh, notice that you start to sweat. You're releasing water that's all over your surface. Well, that water, as soon as it gets released from your pores, will begin to absorb that heat energy. Afterwards, it's going to evaporate and be removed from your body. So sweating is actually a really great example of how our bodies are able to then maintain our temperature through this evaporative process. Again, because water has the ability to absorb so much heat energy. Another interesting thing about uh, temperature and water is that water in colder temperatures will turn into ice, as we well know in this Michigan climate. But that layer of ice, not the whole, the whole lake might not freeze. Uh, so, for instance, right down the road, St. Clair Shores, we have our lake, Lake St. Clair. Uh, just the top layer or the first couple inches might be frozen, but underneath there's actually liquid water. That ice will actually serve as an insulation so that aquatic life below, so the fish, uh, in this example they have some krill, that they can still survive underneath the ice. And it actually helps keep below, it helps keep the temperature above the freezing point so that it will not freeze over. So large bodies of water will not entirely freeze. If you have small ponds and things, those might entirely freeze uh, if they happen to be small enough. But... Ice has this nice property that it can actually insulate and it floats too, which is really convenient. So it will go to the top and it will then insulate from the top down, which is pretty nice. Last but not least, some interesting things about it is that water is referred to as a universal solvent or the solvent for life. So inside of us, you may have heard the fact that we're approximately two thirds water and that's about true, give or take. Um, but basically think about us as kind of walking water sacks of dissolved things. That's kind of what we are. We're like walking solutions. And so we have two things. You want to define some terms. Uh, a solution, if you may recall from chemistry, being a homogeneous mixture. So we have two or more substances being dissolved within something. For instance, water in this case. We have solutes and solvents. You can recall this by thinking what is being dissolved and what's doing the dissolving. Water, you can remember, is a universal solvent. It does the dissolving. So we dissolve things into water. Water is not dissolved itself. So we can dissolve things like salt is a great example uh, as a solute instead of a solvent. So water can dissolve a lot of things. And now this ties back to this whole polarity, slightly positive and slightly negative. If you look at the image, so we have something like table salt, NaCl, some sodium chloride. Sodium will break apart into a positive ion, and chlorine will break apart into the negative ions. Now we have our charges back. And notice, if you look very carefully, of those water molecules, the way that they orient themselves, so that the oxygens, the big red ones, the negative charges, will be pointed towards the sodiums, the positives. Whereas in the chlorines, they have all the little white spheres, those are the hydrogens, with the slightly positive are going to be geared towards the negative 
uh, chlorine ions. So again, this, this concept of polarity allows us to then do this whole dissolving process very efficiently. This is referred to as a general rule of thumb is like like dissolves like. So if we have things that are dissolved in water, they're referred to as hydrophilic. If they are repelled by water or they're not going to be dissolved in water, they're referred to as hydrophobic. Once again, if we break this into prefix and suffix, the word hydro literally refers to water. Philic or phile means a liking or attraction to, whereas phobic or phobia means a fear of something. So hydrophilic means water loving or water attractiveness. Things that are also going to be polar or charged, like for instance, ions, uh, cellulose, sugar, salt, these would be great examples located all within our blood are great examples of things that are hydrophilic. They're attracted to water molecules, ergo they will dissolve properly. Versus if we have hydrophobic, water fearing, things like uh, oil or lipids and fats. If you've ever tried to put a drop of uh, oil in water, it will not. This is also for the record, fun life fact, don't ever try to put a grease or oil fire out with water because they don't mix and in fact you're just going to splash oil around even more spreading the fire larger so a little fun life tip for you uh, our membranes as cells are actually made out of lipids if you recall as we'll cover later the phospholipid bilayer is actually a hydrophobic substance that actually is in there as well to prevent our water from then leaking out uh, here's a close-up again. We can see some, uh, some of the hydrogen bonding represented by the dashed lines. There's that delta symbol, the little squiggle positive, squiggle negative, and relating to our water molecules. Thank you all for watching. Let me know if you have any more questions.